Welcome to Connected. Once again, we meet here in order to get together and learn a little more about other people, other countries, other cultures, and other habits. I hope you had a great week and you're getting ready to enjoy your weekend and to unfollow your thoughts from about work, about your family, getting ready to do what you like, and so on. I want to remind you that I'm talking to you all the way from Santa Cruz, Bolivia in South America. My name is Fabiana Espinosa and I'm going to be guiding you on this journey. to review the best of the 26 interviews we had so far. Yes, it has been 26 wonderful human beings that I had the pleasure to interview here. Among my guests, I had the opportunity to meet amazing human beings that dedicate their lives to improve our experiences in this world. Coming from different point of views, different experiences and different habits, these people are active and effective on their work and their lives. In the music area, we had the opportunity to chat with Hernán Ergueta, Amada Espinosa, and Diego Mendez, aka DJ Cosmic Sound. Let's check them out. In each of his compositions, he proposes the mixture of local traditions and cultures in a new world culture that does not represent nations but human beings as free individuals. In my musical and artistic career, I consider it that I have been climbing steps. Uh, every project I, I did was a step that cost me and that I have already overcome. Um, Hello, everybody. <laughs> I am Amado Espinosa, and I am uh, happy to share my story. If you, if you have a dream, and it's like, a, in my case, is um, I want to be a musician. So, in the beginning, it was hard for me because you know, in especially in my country, in Bolivia, uh, I didn't have a lot of support. So, and in, in, in the musician life is not easy. <laughs> so, but my message is, if you have a dream, you need to fight for it. The biggest challenge now, I am gonna play in the biggest festivals of the planet. And, and bring my music and to all these festivals and and bring the name of Bolivia as high as possible. I want to everyone know where, where I am come from and the reward that I have, Fabi, you don't have an idea. The smiles that I see when I play. Playing. And for these girls that believe in equality, truly believe in equality, there are no limits when it comes to help others find their place in society. Let's remember Daniela Viviesca, Alexis Vargas, and Ariel Igossi. Her name is Alexis Vargas and she is um, living right now currently in Vancouver, but she is originally from Bolivia. 
being passionate about uh, what you do is key, right? So whatever you do, uh, if, if you are in the business sector, it's fine. Um, it's just that you need to, to do it with passion because then you're gonna feel about good about your job. And if it's not part of your job, just serving in the nonprofit sector, then you can find ways to serve. Uh, so I, I think passion is is one of the the the, uh, the key points here. And if you feel passionate about serving and you really wanna live to serve, uh, do it and, and, and be patient, I think, because uh, it's not easy. Um, especially in, in countries where the social, social sector is not as developed as in, in the developed countries, it's very hard to, uh, to uh, it, it takes a while, right? To find the resources, connecting dots and, um, and, and building relationships. And the third one actually is building relationships. Uh, is, is when you have an opportunity to, uh, to do a project, even if, if it's a small project and you get a donation or you get something, build this relationship, uh, be transparent about using the resources so that you can build a very healthy relationship with the people are, that are supporting your mission, supporting your passion. Um, and then build relationships also with the people you serve because if they don't know you, um, it is very hard to make an impact in people that don't know you. They, they won't care about the services that you provide. They don't believe in you, right? So building relationships, being patient and being passionate about what you do, I think. I am already connected with my friend Aria Ligossi. She is right now in New York and for the ones that are just landing to the show we are talking today about the pros of uh, having or managing an account on Instagram take bikini pictures with a bunch of you know filters on vacation um, so my aim and goal with the kind of you know the Instagram project that I'm doing is to sort of sort of show um, the other side of that of myself being very vulnerable being very authentic um, and of course, um, using it as a platform for education, for everything that I'm learning to be able to share and pass along to other people um, who maybe want to learn that perspective also and try to make the world a little bit of a better place. You can follow me um, at Lady, L-A-D-Y, Savage, S-A-V-A-J. And please say hi and let me know that you were listening. In the area of healing, yoga has gained a special place in our culture. We had the pleasure to speak with Johan Lockian from Mexico and Natalia Gallardo from Peru. Uh, one thing that I will actually recommend, it's like, um, first of all, you're gonna start and, you know, first of all, check with your surgeon and your oncologist so you can engage now in activity. Uh, that's the first uh -huh. thing. And the second one, once you have that clearance that yes, you can move, you're gonna start, you know, doing exercises or mindful exercises. Uh, I think that you need to check in these studios. First of all, how many years that person has been teaching? And if they, you know, have the knowledge for in therapeutics. Um, I'm not gonna say that you go to certain schools because that's not, uh, that I don't want to get into that. I think that also schools of yoga have a background in therapeutics, although they're certain more immersed in the therapeutics. Uh, but uh, let's say they just want to do some yoga, just make sure that you go and find out what the certification that the teacher certified, that at least that teacher has at least three years of you know practicing and at least another five of teaching, and that you engage first in something gentle and that you are, you know, just you can trust that, you know, they know what you're going through, what are the limitations in your body, and they can actually support you on that. Otherwise, you know, yoga is more than the pose. You can go and engage in meditation, you can go and engage in breathing techniques, and I don't see that that's, um, you know, you can go and do that everywhere. And maybe if yoga as a postural asana practice, you know, the physical part of the, of the, of the yoga, it's just not where you live. I think that there's groups, you know, that again can offer like uh, breathing techniques of meditation and that's part of yoga too. So I will do that. And I think that that will bring a lot of benefit too. Uh, really someone that guides you step by step. Uh, it helps you to make the changes that you need or that you want. It's kind of you design your life the way you want it and sometimes you feel that you need certain changes in different aspects 
But for me, I needed to integrate yoga because I know yoga is an amazing tool to control your mind, to be in peace, happy, um, yeah, and be the, I think, the best you can be. The products made out of hemp are a reality nowadays, and they are helping people on their fight with some diseases and conditions, such as cancer, Parkinson, depression, and so on. John Laurie told us his story as a hemp grower. Yeah, this is something like an old time story because once uh, same people started in the 90s, middle of the 90s, was the law in Swiss more liberal to cannabis. And in this time it was not forbidden to plant hemp as long as you don't use it as drug. That means right. as long as you, yeah, as you produced some iced tea with it and take the THC out, was no problem to produce something. But uh, yeah, this was uh, also a thing that we can produce a lot of different products in this time. And exactly, you can do a lot of with it. Then the next comes the seed. Seed bring oil, oil that you can use for E, oil that you can use uh, Years, 100 years before for burning lamps. Um, it's, uh, the other thing is, it's a really good oil. It's, uh, it's like olive oil, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a vital oil. It has a lot of vitamins inside, uh, amino acids. It's uh -huh. better than, than, than other, other oils that we have in these times. Uh, but in this time, I think it will get a big revival, especially for food, medicine and for textile. We talked about art and we had the pleasure to meet artists on the field of painting, fashion and ballet. Enzo Barbado shared the art of embroidery. And from Miami, Chloe Freitag delighted us with her determination and power on the path of ballet. So for people that don't dare to, to step out of the box and, and truly uh, devote the time, I would say don't waste a minute. Uh, no one is old enough not to learn. Even if you're 60, 70, 80, or 90, and you have never done any kind of art in your life, uh, we live within um, an environment that is completely based on uh, artistic expression. And it won't take long before you can create something for yourself. So, um, That's true. I know that there, there uh, you know, I know that there are a lot of, um, uh, cultures in which perhaps men are not uh, uh, seen uh, doing a certain type of uh, art or craft and uh, you need to remove that from your brain and you need to understand that stigmas don't take you anywhere but to failure. Uh, everything you, you uh, pursue in life should be done with a, um, with a blank uh, page and never go in thinking that what other people think or what other people have done in the past um, right. are rules to abide your future. So uh, anyone should be, and, 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 and in fact, uh, uh, Fabiana, um, I encourage everyone in, in this program and anyone that is listening to our conversation to keep something in mind. Um, you must have an artistic part in your life in order for you to thrive fully. Even if you're a, a completely non-artistical person, uh, there is something <laughs> that can be done. You can do. Uh -huh. Yes. So work the left and the right of your brain. Don't just focus on one. And uh, this will keep you uh, happier, healthier, and more connected to the world, to nature, and, and definitely to your surroundings. So just dare to do it and don't be afraid and ask questions, read. And like I said, there's free information in different, uh, you know, channels, the internet and something that a lot of people right. don't do today is called books. 
You can also go to a library. <laughs> you can also go and, and find you know, them. Definitely, like we have already been talking about the 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 work on your mind and your mental capacity for dance is so important, and that translates for everything. I mean, it's not just for people who are interested in dance, but anybody who really takes the time to strengthen your mind and strengthen your own inner connection. I mean, it's going to help you immensely. Um, and then, of course, too, um, for ballet, like, I mean, we love what we do, right? We do this, and, and anybody who dances knows how fulfilling it is to get on a stage. But we can't do it without an audience. <laughs> like, if no one cares to see it, there's nothing to give. The whole, I love, um, you know, dance and its origin is storytelling. You know, it's not just, oh, pretty pictures and lions and somebody doing something beautiful. It, the origin is storytelling. And you look at all the, even classic ballets, they're telling a story. And now dance has evolved where it's not necessarily such a clear story, but it's always, there's always an emotion that's trying to be portrayed or passed through to the audience members. And that's a conversation. You don't have a conversation just by yourself. You have to have somebody there to, to tell it to. Correct. Being healthy nowadays is a concept that goes beyond oneself. We live in a time where the need of developing a relationship with what we feel, what we think, eat and dress is necessary in order to evolve. Let's remember what Alessandro Farana, Pamela Wasabi and Marcos Aliaga taught us. Veganism is a, it's a commitment. It's a lifestyle that doesn't include any animal products in, uh, in your daily choices, in your daily purchases, uh, in food, in clothing, in any kind of material that you won't even uh, sometimes believe, like wine, for example, as some of the wines has animal products in it. And I didn't know until like uh, right, right by opening the restaurant. So it's a, could be called a sacrifice for some, for some reason, but it's definitely uh, the best choice I've made in my life. And health-wise, I feel lighter. Every meal I do, every other meal, uh, after my meals, I just feel lighter. Before, when I was not vegan, and I was eating uh, all kinds of meat every time, every day, uh, my digestion system was also, was also much slower. And um, I felt much acidity and, and stomach pain. Uh, now, really, I don't have any of those problems. I haven't used any medicine in more than five years because I didn't need to. Most of the conversation about food is not about food, but it's about how you how you show up to the table, right? And what your thoughts are, are saying about food and what you yourself, uh, the story that you are telling yourself about yourself and how you see yourself and how you respect yourself. So this book is that, it's exploring the relationship that we have about food, which really have the book here. Uh -huh. It's called uh, Nourish, the plant-based path to health and happiness. And um, the whole idea is that for me, in the path, the way that I befriend food is through this path of um, plant-based, this discovery of plant-based cuisine that I had. But my invitation is not to instill a dogma in you, but uh, my invitation is to um, is to invite you to understand that you yourself have a very intimate relationship with food and it's your job to discover it, to um, explore it, and to enjoy it. I would say now, for the in the beginning, sustainable fashion was in a group that was looked upon by a lot of people that it was boring or it wasn't you know, as fun and a lot of people didn't take it seriously. And I find now, it's uh, especially the, the younger generation is really um, focused on building a better future, sustainability, animal rights. So I find now all the brands that are coming out that are really focused on sustainable uh, fashion and ethics is uh, they're trying to go at par with the normal mainstream brands that you see in the market now. So you right. see a lot of people starting very strong uh, with a business sense of it before it was more just an ideal now you can see there's a business part of it that is to compete with a lot of the big brands 
new times require new habits and also new lifestyles. Fernanda Peñarrieta told us about permaculture and in order to know oneself better to reach happiness, we have to take time and action for and towards ourselves, according to Bernardo Zabalaga and his Cosmo Magic. So as it sounds, it, it, um, it kind of brings the idea of uh, having a new type of relationship with nature, but also with yourself. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, to consider yeah, the other, not only to uh, someone who you are going to take advantage, uh, just to everything you say, everything you put in the air, as well you put in, in your heart, you put in other ears, uh, that will bring a lot of consequence consequence for uh, before so to take care of every relationship in permaculture uh, there is like three uh, ethics like um, principles and one is to take care of the earth other is to take care of the humans and the other that is very important right now fair shares no because now we have uh, this unbalanced system a lot of products not too many people having it so at the same time take care of the earth take care of the people and fair shares are like these principles moral principles of the permaculture this is not not something really new it's just a different way of approaching um, a very old subject which is uh, let's put it in this way, is a, a way of co-creating our life. So, what does this mean? This means that uh, in what I teach, in a way, is to understand how we um, develop our awareness of how energy works. And in the way that we develop this awareness, we can broaden up our perception. And when we expand our perception, we can understand how we are creating or co-creating our life uh, with other people, with other humans, and but also with uh, other um, expanded ways of thinking the energy, which is the universe. That's why this practice is called Cosmo Magic, which is cosmic co-creation. The magic is uh, a word that I, uh, in a way, um, learned from all practices, uh, which is the magic practices, but in, to talk about this uh, term that I'm calling co-creation, which is the way we create our lives. The way we uh, right. co-create it, the way we manifest in, in, in the energy. Sometimes in history, we can find valuable information that can help us find what makes us more alike than different. Dr. Karim Reyes and Dr. Andrew Morrow were in charge to open our minds with their knowledge of the Middle East culture. In the same fashion that it is dishonest and duplicitous um, to take quotations from the Quran out of context, um, it, it is deceitful to do the same thing with the Bible. And so in that presentation, in that article, I take certain problematic citations or verses from the Bible, which uh, incite violence. Uh, and so in the same way a person can use the Quran to try to demonstrate that Islam is a religion of hate and violence, a person can easily do the same thing with the Bible in order to prove that you know Christianity and Judaism are religions of hatred and violence. Now, obviously, I did this for a didactic purpose, for an educational <laughs> purpose, because I, as a Muslim, have the greatest respect for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As Muslims, we believe in Adam, we, we believe in Abraham, we believe in Moses, we believe in Jesus, and we believe uh, in the seal of the prophets, uh, Muhammad, uh, the son of Abdullah. And so, um, yes, what I did was to compare and to contrast verses from the Quran, 
uh, and verses right. from the Bible, uh, showcasing some of the more difficult passages, but also focusing on the passages that promote love and kindness and understanding and justice. So it was uh, an educational um, experience for uh, for readers and for the audience. Um, you can you can just not help but marvel the generosity of every the generosity that every pilgrim receives when they when they arrive there. Um, these people work all year just to be able to feed people and and clothe them and you know, and it takes your breath away the the amount uh, right. of generosity that that you see there, and um, you know it's and it could it cannot be measured. I don't think so. But Iraq has has been the world's most generous to strangers, according to a new global index of charitable giving, and I think rightly so because you know, and they are retaining the values of hospitality from their ancestors. I personally love learning from people and their experiences. Noah Friedma, Flor Francis, and Heidi Setaro are professionals that know what they want regardless of the country they find themselves in. They are true go-getters. And I think I started seeing in Latin America um, a lot of opportunities for major social change to happen and that interested me as a journalist to, to go cover and be a part of. Um, I figured I would stay for about a year when I moved down to Bolivia in 2004, but it ended up uh, being much longer. Immigration is always a challenge, you know, going through like the visas, the paperwork, like all the interviews that sometimes you feel that you're guilty of something that, but you're not, you know, so those things added pressure, of course, and always, you know, to, uh, to everything um, right. but um, besides that uh, professionally the challenge was to to be able to make the right contacts and to be able to uh, make a living of what I wanted in a in a city that I didn't know that much at the moment so I had to work uh, as a server I had to like walk a lot I had to you know, like a uh, hassle in a way until I got uh, where I wanted to be and I, until I was able to, to make a living out of, uh, out of music and out of uh, marketing and journalism. That I love to visit, I love to go anywhere all over the world to be able to see them close up. Obviously in our day-to-day -day lives and in our, the cities that we live, it, we are very limited to what we can see. I don't like to see animals in zoos or in shows. I don't like any of that. I don't I don't even photograph with animals that have a chain or have something in their ear or neck. I don't like that because right. that brings a story to me. If I'm going to photograph an animal, if I'm going to be with an animal, I want it to be natural and when they're relaxed and happy. So to me, that's right. that's that's an experience I just can't describe. The importance of knowing our roots, our culture, and the amazing products that only some countries make is almost mandatory nowadays. It is pure pride. Enzo Moreno and Alejandro Bilbao La Vieja have their stories. Long considered the national spirit of Bolivia, the Bolivian government has enacted a series of legislative actions to officially recognize the Singani as an exclusive and native product of Bolivia that... Yes. Well, basically, uh, it was a, a, the need inside of the community, of the Latin American community, having a space that will reflect uh, important aspects of our culture, of our background, of our heritage. Uh, Latin America is a very diverse uh, region going from Mexico to Central America. She was one of my first guests, but for as much time that have passed, we haven't forgot her. 
and uh, we still remember and I still strongly believe that what we need in this world is more people that take time to share experiences with others. Mama Edie, a storyteller that dedicates her life to do that, to create moments and to share the love she has on herself. And so I began with George III. I became George III and I explained that he's called George III because his daddy's name was George. He was George II. And his daddy before him, he was George I. And that's how this guy got to be George III. So within the story, <laughs> I see in my teaching the um, civics aspect, but I'm also teaching that system of, uh, of, of naming, you know, that somebody is the third and the fourth and that kind of thing. So I became George okay. III, sent his red coats over. I became the red coats. <laughs> I, right. I became the, the uh, Paul Revere and his horse. I was galloping across the classroom. <laughs> the classroom teacher was falling out laughing. I was the Native Americans with their bows and arrows. I was the new Americans up in the trees. I was everybody all by myself. Aww. Everybody fell out laughing. But the key is that after I was done, the children had learned all the concepts they needed to understand. And they all, every last one of them passed that test. And I said, we reached the end of the show and I hope you enjoyed it. I want to tell you that none of this is possible without you. So you are also an important, the most important part of this show. I want to see you again in seven days. If you know somebody that is doing something great for the world or would like to share their story in order to inspire, teach or help someone, please write me. My email address is conectadosbolivia24 at gmail.com. Stay connected and I'll see you in a week. Goodbye.